The Oklahoma City Thunder just lost to the Indiana Pacers in brutal fashion. Is the season over after this loss? Plus, what are the Thunder missing over the last few weeks? We'll talk about that coming up on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOTHUNDERPOD. Email the show, LOTHUNDERPOD at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel, of course, is the official sports book of Lockdown. Make every moment more by visiting FanDuel.com slash Lockdown today to get started we're going to dive into the Oklahoma City Thunder falling to the Indiana Pacers in just a brutal game and I'm doing something a little bit different today so let me know what you think about it Uh, normally I come on here and have the outline very very or at least try to be very um you know prepared but also measured and rational and everything else we're recording this the second that the buzzer sounds in Indy. And you're just going to get the thoughts of this game. And maybe it's going to be a terrible show, but it's going to be a great show. We'll find out. But in this game, the Thunderfall, 121-117. And I understand that the vast majority of fans are feeling this sense of disappointment, anger, frustration, whatever the case is. And those feelings are incredibly valid. Because that's what sports are. Like, that's the whole point of this. That's why sports is the industry that it is. That's why I live and have a living and have a job and have a career and have a full-time job is because of you. You guys caring about guys trying to put a basket in a hoop. And so when you get to this point in the season, when it, when you're sitting here at March 31st, and the Thunder are in the postseason race, and right now in the postseason still after this loss, When you're sitting here in this moment and you've endured 70 plus game, you know, obviously 70 plus games of this and you're, you know, four games away from finishing the 82 game season. It's okay to get invested. It's okay to want this team to win. You're not an idiot for that. And to act like, oh, well, because things are so great long-term means you can't have have opinions or feelings or, or frustrations now is silly. Because we're talking about now. Now, in the summertime, we'll talk about the future and how great it still is, no matter how this season ends. So let's first and foremost state that. No matter what happens in the last four games, no matter what happens beyond these last four games, if the Thunder are lucky enough to play after Easter, the future stays the same. The future stays incredible. The future stays great. But the present is disappointing after a week like this where you're looking on the precipice of making the postseason and you play in Portland, you play at home twice against the Hornets and the Pistons, then you go play the Pacers who are playing nobody. They're not playing Therese Halliburton. They're not playing Miles Turner. Now, they're still NBA players, and we discussed all week long how NBA players in games like this are incredibly dangerous because they're playing for something bigger than the standings. They're playing for their lives, their career, everything that we just listed before this. Right? So, so they are still opponents you have to be measured and you have to be focused and you have to play intense and you have to take seriously on that other side of the court. That's obvious. But f- from a fan base perspective, that is, is what you're looking at this week and you only won one game in that stretch. So fans are in, increasingly, and, and, and fans have the absolute right to feel emotional and, and whatever emotion that means. For this week. That's obvious. And that doesn't mean that they're outcasted or that they don't understand the bigger long-term plan and the behind the scenes puppet strings of Sam Presti. No, they get all that. They do. The vast majority of you get that no matter if this team does or does not make the postseason, no matter what you're rooting for, the future is still incredibly bright. This doesn't really matter. These, these next four games will not make or break what the future of this team looks like. But you can still want this team to win and want this team to make the playoffs because you've invested your time, money, Whatever you've invested into this, 
even if it's just listening to this podcast five days a week, which I incredibly, uh, it, it profusely thank you for that. Whatever you've invested, whatever time, effort, money, anything you've invested into this, brain power, whatever it is, emotions, you want that investment to to continue and to and to get sort of rewarded, so to say, in a postseason uh, run. That's perfectly fine, for, perfectly within your right. So I'm not going to sit here and act holier than now that you shouldn't care if they do or don't because it um, remove emotion emotions and just think about it from a team building standpoint. Uh, but in this game, I think that there are reasons for what you're feeling, right? So let's start addressing them. First thing that people have said is the energy has lacked. The defensive intensity has lacked. This Thunder team no longer looks overwhelming or 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 prepared or plays as crisp as they used to defensively or whatever the case is. You'll fill in your, your explanatories. The, the main focus, the main umbrella that people are sitting under is about energy and effort. Well, look, this team has played 17 games this month. And that's not an excuse. That's about youth. These guys are not used to playing 82 games. Like, think about who this team's relying on. Think about who this team is is focusing on to make a run and, and, and needing them to drag them to the postseason. It's guys who have not been in this position before, who have not had to navigate 82 games. You don't play 82 games in college, so that takes away all the rookies. If you were a rookie the last couple of years, you haven't played 82 games. And if you're SGA and Lou Dort, you've only played an 82-game season one time. One time. And I'm not talking about, you know, oh, it's because of the injuries. No, literally, the pandemic happened. And then ever since their rookie year, the season's been short. And, and Lou Dort has never played an 82-game schedule because his rookie year is when the pandemic actually happened. So only SGA on this roster that's fully healthy right now uh, has played an 82-game stretch. You know, and Sarge, but Sarge is not in this equation. You're not leaning on Sarge. Everyone that you're leaning on has never played in this type of environment besides SGA one time. And in that one time, he was a rookie on the Clippers, did play a pivotal role with the Clippers, and did help them in the postseason uh, steal a couple games. Whatever the case is, still, it's only one time that he's experienced this. So that matters. It, it's incredibly hard to play 17 basketball games in a, in, a, in a month. And so obviously, your intensity, your focus, your juice, whatever, is going to wane. That's just natural. And, and being young is actually a detriment in that category because you would think, well, their bodies can respond better, their bodies can snap back better. Well, yes, but every team is going to drop games like this. Every team's going to have nights where they just can't get up and, and they just lose to teams that they shouldn't lose to on paper. The difference is when the Celtics lose to the Wizards, yeah, they're going to go beat the Bucks twice, though, in this season. Or they're going to go beat the whoever twice, though, in this season to where they make up for that game that they lost to, to, to the Wizards. Where the Thunder... You know, they can steal games. They have stolen games. They have played up to those type of teams, but it's just not a guarantee that they will. And so now the outlook looks dangerous. Whereas if you're the Celtics in this spot, right? Let's say that the Celtics desperately needed this game against the Pacers. They lo they lost it. And now they're staring down the barrel of Suns, you know, Warriors, Jazz, Grizzlies. What game in there would you say that the Celtics can't win? That's the difference in like being an experienced team and a team that's truly contending versus the position of the Thunder are in. So, so... Energy and effort waning is not an indictment on Mark. It's not an indictment on this team. It's not an indictment on anybody other than they simply just do not know how to navigate an 82-game season with what it takes physically. So that is, is out of there. In terms of how the defense, is, how the defense is, has fallen off a bit down this last you know, few weeks, a lot of that is, number one, Kenny Hustle. Like you cannot understate losing Kenny Williams. And this point here ties into everything. Losing Kenneth Williams, one, he would have turned the tide in at least two of these games. Sure, I'm not going to say that he would never let you have a off night or never let you have a night where you don't produce energy or juice, but 99.999% of the times, he would find a way before that 48 minutes are up to turn the tide in terms of intensity that this team is bringing to where that takes care of business there. Also defensively, he was your very best small ball five, and one of the very best small ball fives in the league, but we're not going to get into that debate right now. But in terms of this this season, this team, he was your best weapon playing that small ball five. So you can no longer go small as effectively as you once did. That takes away an entire weapon in Mark's, in, in Mark's back pocket. You just can't do it anymore and be as effective as you once were. 
Then you had Poku and JRE sustain serious injuries to where now they don't even look close to the same that they were at one point in this year. Like at one point in this year, both those guys were playing really well, specifically Poku. And he hasn't looked the same since injury. And that's okay because it's hard to bounce back mid-season from an injury like this. And it's hard to get your groove back uh, like this. And, and we will forget how good Poku was at the start of the year because of this is how his season's going to end and not playing as good. But like those things matter. And those things add up. And those things catch up to you. And so it's all kind of all came, not crashing down, but I'm going to say catching up at the exact same time. And that is what hurts for OKC right now. And that's what explains sort of the effort, sort of the defense falling off because strategically they're playing the exact same way. It's just the parts within that system are not the same. They're not the same caliber. They're not the same production and thus it looks worse. And that's playing the results versus playing the process. It goes back to that Oklahoma article, which I don't want to harp on because it's just a, a, you know, it's not an indictment on the Oklahoma's coverage on the Thunder. It's just that, you know, it got put out there by an opinion of a fan, which matters. Mark didn't dupe anyone by playing longer lineups. That simply is a falsehood. They've been doing it all season long. But furthermore, in this game, a game you have to win, a game that you have to get in Indiana, you lose 121-117 by only playing 10 players only nine of those 10 players played over 10 minutes. And what are the comments saying right now? If you go look on Reddit, social media, my mentions, whatever, I would have thrown in Trey Mann for a change of pace. I would have thrown in Pokashevsky longer. I would have played Jerry, whatever the case, who, insert your player here. So it just goes back to you're, you're danged if you do, danged if you don't, right? And if you don't win, they're going to find a reason for why you didn't win to make it feel better. But sometimes you don't win because you're a young team and because uh, you didn't have your best stuff. And because these injuries catch up to you. And that's not even factoring in Chet Holmgren because you haven't had Chet Holmgren all year. Uh, so you're not really having to adjust to that at this present moment. But it is what it is. And the and this would feel entirely different if SGA's turnaround baseline jumper, which he hits all the time, which he used to beat Portland, falls in. We'd be feeling the same way that we felt about that Portland game. Go watch that Portland game and cut it off before SGA throws up that buzzer beater and act like the Thunder lost that game. And think about every little thing that the Thunder did in that game that you would have said was the reason that they lost and had a full-blown panic attack over. That's just the life of fan bases, and that's okay. And that's kind of what, what it is. But the Thunder lost this game because of their youth and because they didn't have Kenneth Williams. I think that those are the two reasons why. I think if they were more experienced, they would have been able to, to kind of turn the tide in this one, or if they had Kenny Hustle, they have been able to turn the tide in this one. And you win this game, and it, prov- and it provides a big boost for you moving forward. Now, is the season over? We'll talk about that coming up. But first, I want to say right now, the better good friends over at FanDuel, FanDuel.com slash Lockdown is where you want to go, and there is a pivotal game coming up on the docket for OKC in the NBA. It will happen tomorrow Dallas against Miami. Dallas going down to South Beach. They've been there like three days, so maybe uh, maybe Miami's undefeated there in the nightlife scene. But Dallas is plus one in the AAA. They don't call it that anymore. They don't call it the American Airlines Arena, I guess. But nonetheless, uh, Dallas is plus one on the road in Miami. So go check it out today with FanDuel because they are the best sports book in America. Whenever you use the code LOCKDOWN, you get and you're a new customer, you get a $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. So check it out today, fandor.com slash locked on. That's fandor.com slash locked on. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Now look, why did the Thunder lose this game? So let's just, let's just go through it all. The very, very, very last play of the game for the Thunder where... They're trying to go fast. Jalen Williams makes an errant pass to Isaiah Joe. I think that th- that, that is an example of where the youth kicks in, where the youth happens, because those seconds feel a lot quicker when you have not been in that moment before. And I think that the, that the process was correct. You needed to go fast there, not because of the time necessarily, but because Indiana will foul you up three, as we saw on the prior possession. And so the very best thing you could have done there was to get the ball to Isaiah Joe before the half-court defense recovers, before you get set into a half-court set, and just have him launch a three. 
but the pass has to be there, has to be online, and it wasn't. And so you, the ball doesn't bounce your way there, the ball doesn't bounce your way on the SGA baseline turnaround, and you lose the game. Whereas if either of those two things happen, the sky isn't falling right now in Oklahoma City. You've survived in advance and lived to fight fight another day. Just as the sky wasn't falling against Charlotte after, I mean, against uh, Detroit after they played a, a particularly bad game against Detroit, um, and up until they didn't, up until they got the t- the, the putback. Another way that the youth shows its its head is that the Thunder have lost to weak teams and they've gone out there and lost to teams that weren't trying. They've gone out there and lost to teams who didn't have their very best lineups possible. But the Thunder haven't been here before. The Thunder don't know what that's like. It's the Thunder who are supposed to be playing and surprising people and playing loose and playing their style of basketball. They're not supposed to be feeling the standings crushing in on them with each and every passing miss. Look, the Thunder players, regardless of what you want to interpret any message as, the Thunder players want to play in the postseason. SGA put on his Instagram story as such, and his Instagram post as such, put himself out there as a public NBA player uh, who, who... who it's we know in this world of toxicity and NBA fan culture, like some meme accounts and everything, are going to clown that post if SGA and OKC do not cling on to this 10th seed. But he put out there once playing the playoffs, and with each miss in a game like this, you feel it. You feel the, the pressure. You feel the, t- the team tightening up. You feel that, okay, there are only X amount of winnable games left in terms of like whenever we're going to be the favorites. This one has to be it for us. And then you start pressing. You stop playing your style of basketball. The shots don't go in. You shot abysmal from three. And you lose. Whereas Indiana can just, it doesn't matter. Like, like you miss a shot, fine. Go, go continue to just play your style of basketball as the Thunder did the last two years. Which is how the Thunder shocked some people over the last two years. But you could tell that, that this young team wants to be in the playoffs. And with each mistake against teams that they know they're supposed to beat and need to beat, just like Ludort said, they understood they needed to beat the Hornets. Like, they understood that. They understand the situation. They can talk about how they don't watch the standings. They understand the standings. They understand the situation. With every mistake, it gets tighter. And that was never supposed to be where this team was ready for yet. And so if they're not ready for that for that moment, if they're not ready to play in games like this where the games are possession by possession and are, uh, you know, crushing in terms of pressure, that's fine. They're the second youngest team in NBA history. They're the youngest team in the NBA right now. That's perfectly fine and perfectly on schedule for where they're supposed to be. But it does feel disappointing as a fan pace because you've watched this team play and overcome some of that throughout the year. But overall, this game was a bad loss. No one can dispute that. But there are explanations for it. And there are fans who deserve the right to be upset about it. And there are fans who will choose to not be upset about it. And neither one is right or wrong. And neither one is an indictment on how you should or should not be a fan. But the bottom line is, Teacher McConnell scores 21 points off the bench and seven pacers score in double figures. Like Those are NBA players. Those are players who uh, are playing for more, even though they didn't have Therese Halliburton, didn't have Miles Turner, didn't have these great players that are on their roster. But the Thunder have played in now 42 clutch time games. And that's a great experience for this team. And that, and that's great experience to adjust to moving forward. And another way that the Thunder aren't prepared to be on this side of things, the Thunder the last couple of years, and obviously parts of this year, have been the comeback kids, have been the, the guys that have stormed back from down 15 plus and, and, and from down double digits and, and, and you know all the stats from the last couple of seasons. Like, they've been that team. And in the third quarter of this game, the Thunder stretched their lead to 10 points. And by two minutes into the fourth, they've lost their lead. It's a 15-point swing, and there were 17 lead changes in this one, 11 ties. 17 lead changes, 11 ties. But the Thunder, in the third quarter, about midway through, they grew a 10-point lead. There was only three minutes left, further than midway through, there was only like three minutes left in the frame. And the Thunder had a 10-point lead. That should be control. But with a young team like this, who is not used to being in that spot, who doesn't understand how to close out games, who doesn't understand how to weather the storm whenever you're in that position, 
They can tighten up. They can make mistakes. They can turn one mistake into two, into three, into four, and then all of a sudden, your lead's gone because basketball's a game of runs. There were moments where this Thunder defense was playing overwhelmingly great basketball and flustering the Pacers. Five-second calls, shot clock violations, turnovers, just doing everything right. And there were moments after that where the Thunder did everything wrong. And that is the, the dichotomy of a young team. Like, that is the ebbs and flows of a very young team. Again, let me read out the stat. Second youngest team in NBA history. So if they don't understand how to close out games, which it doesn't appear that they do this week, that's how life goes when you're in this position. And so there are still positive things to take from not only this game, but obviously the season, but that doesn't also matter all the time. But I'm just going to provide the analysis for why I think that this happened. And that's not excuses for why it happened. It's just why I think that it happened. And I could be wrong. And the players could could call me an idiot and say that, well, you know, we understand how to win games. It's just that we didn't win this one. Okay, that's fine. I'm just telling you what it appears uh, on the surface. And before we dive into individual performances, I know that everything seems terrible right now. And that it seems like the sky is falling but you still hold the tiebreaker over Dallas. And if there's any team and any coach that could absolutely squander this opportunity, it's the 2023 Dallas Mavericks. It's 2023 Jason Kidd. Those two, that that duo is not out of the woods. They should be. The Thunder let them off the hook, as as some would say. I apologize for not remembering the... the, uh, the Cardinals coach who said that. I believe it's Coach Green. I don't know that for a fact. But the Thunder let him off the hook. That's obvious. But if there's one team that wouldn't capitalize on that, it's the Thunder. It's the Mavericks. And the Thunder have had a track record of playing up and down to their competition throughout their history of the franchise. But but even this core has had a track record of playing up and down to their competition. So what happens if the Thunder go into Sunday and steal one against Phoenix? You will be off your rocker. That's what happened like a week ago. Whenever they lost to the Raptors and the sky was falling, and then they beat the Suns. They've beat the Suns this year. They've beat the Warriors this year. They've beat the Grizzlies this year. They've beat the Jazz this year. And the Jazz seem to be packing it up. But, you know, every time we assume that about the Jazz, they end up proving us wrong. But, like, still, it's not over. It's not over. Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Heck no. Heck no. We'll talk about it coming up. Uh, but we're talking about SGA, Josh Giddy, and J Dub coming up. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. SGA was great, shot 50%. 39 points scored, 10 rebounds, well, 9 rebounds, but 4 assists, a steal, a block. Fouled out in this one. Uh, was forced to foul out because, you know, you had to foul down the stretch and you already had 5. Uh, J-Dub, 60% shooting, 14 points, 6 rebounds, 6 assists, 2 steals. Josh Giddy, 21 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists, shot 47% uh, from the floor. It's just that beyond that, you had Wiggins play extremely well. I thought Lindy gave you good minutes coming back from the from the injury. He had, he had a, a level of plantar fasciitis as well. Um, but then Isaiah Joe played better than his box score showed, but he didn't shoot the ball well, like, and, and that's very important. Like when Isaiah Joe goes 0 for 8 from 3, kind of tells you the kind of day you're going to have from beyond the arc. Um, and that's kind of it. Like those are the guys that showed up. You had SGA, Wiggins, J-Dub, and Getty show up. Uh, up and down game from Lou Dort overall. Um, I, I think that he was fine. Like, I don't think that there's anything to to overly ridicule from him except for the one possession where he got blocked and could have swung the ball out to, to Giddy in the corner uh, instead of pump faking a couple of times. And you lost to the Pacers. This had a, uh, this had big Ricky Rubio energy whenever he just dominated the, uh, the OK three team in the playoffs. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a tough loss. It's a tough loss. That was an animal house reference, by the way, before the break. So quick comment thing about, uh, you know, that, that, inaccurate history lesson I just gave you on the uh, on the uh, segment two ending. But 
we'll see what this team can do moving forward this season. But let's not stop reflecting on how great they've been this season. Like This is more of a ride than we ever could have imagined. And part of sports is the journey. Part of sports is the fact that, hey, back in August, we didn't think that we'd care about a game on March 31st. As a matter of fact, we thought we'd care. We, we, we'd be rooting for this outcome, this loss. We thought that nothing would matter and that nobody would be playing and that uh, you know we'd be just elbow deep in draft profile and projections, which we're going to have to get to after the season's over. So this team gave you a heck of a ride this winter, no matter how it ends. And that's because J-Dub has stepped up so much and looks like a number two overall rookie, even though he's drafted at 12 and you haven't seen your lone top five pick in this in this rebuild play a second of basketball. It's because SGA is an all-NBA guy. It's because Josh Giddy has taken a, a jump that he has not gotten the credit for. It's because for the majority of the season, of course, you had Kenny Hustle, who, who was awesome and one of the best role players in basketball, rotational players in basketball. And no matter how it ends, either playoffs or not, that's awesome. And that's worth worth a huge round of applause on Easter Sunday, if you can make it out to the game. Either either way it goes. But I know it's going to be easy for to spend the next 48 hours until that game tips off, um, doom and gloom, and, 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 and you have every right to feel that way. But I will say, you know, they've beaten... Everyone on their uh, on their schedule, they've beaten them at least once this season. Memphis might not have anything to play for in that last game. Their, their seating might be locked up. Uh, Utah might be done by that game. And then can you steal one against Phoenix and, and, and Golden State? We'll see. I'll be there Sunday. Uh, hope to see many of you out there Sunday. It's been awesome getting to meet some of you guys at the games this year. Uh, and until then, be good and be good to one another.